anyway, so let's get started with today's lecture. We're going to continue on from last week, uh, and I have a lot to cover today, so I, we really need to get through most of it uh, because it will be on the exam. Uh, but I understand if you need to write your free labs, it's fine with me. All right, well, I'm just going to talk, and you can always listen to the lecture afterwards on the video, okay? So, uh, and this lecture will also help you with the assignment and the quiz. Yeah, that's right. I forgot to say that. I, I extended the due date for the lab report to Friday night at midnight. Huh? I don't know if I did it right. Oh, that's okay. We'll, we'll talk about that in lab. But anyway, this, this lecture here, the rest of this lecture here will help you with the questions that are on the assignment I just posted and the, uh, the quiz I just posted. The quiz that's due on Friday and then the assignment that's due on Monday. And then, of course, we have our exam on Monday. Okay, so in continuation, right, when we have buffers, we can do things like add strong acids, right, or a strong base to a buffer, and what's supposed to happen is that the, the, the pH shouldn't change that much, right? The buffer has a, a, a one pH unit buffering region that keeps it so that, you know, the, there's not these big pH changes, right? So the addition of strong acid or base uh, is a neutralization, neutralization reaction. You can calculate the stoichiometry problem to find the concentration of the acid and the conjugate base when all of the acid or base reacts, right? And then to do that, we'll find, use it, we'll, we'll, to find that pH, we'll use the uh, henderson hasselbach equation, right? Because all you need for henderson hasselbach is the Ka and the conjugate base over the acid, right? Or the base over the acid, okay? So this is this week's your welcome chart right here. Sort of, not really, I don't know. But it tells you what happens right, or the, the equation you should be using when you add in, right, uh, either a strong acid or a strong base, okay? So here, if you add in a strong acid, right, the equation you should be using here is the HA, oh, sorry, the uh, conjugate base plus the proton makes HA, right, so strong acid reacts with the conjugate base component of the buffer, and then you can calculate the new HA and H minus, right, and from that, you use the Ka and all calculate to get the pH, on the other hand, if you're doing a strong base to a buffer, right, instead of using A minus and H plus, your equation will actually be a little bit counterintuitive, but it will be the acid plus the hydroxide goes to A minus to the water, and, and plus the water, right? And the reason why that is is because a strong base reacts with the weak acid component of the buffer, right? Uh, the weak acid component of the buffer. So that's that, uh, the, you know, HA right here is the weak acid component, okay? And then once you get that, you can use that for stoichiometry to get your your concentrations that you need to get to the pH from pKa, okay? So, and don't worry, there won't be a lot of these questions today because I have to get through a lot. But here's your first question. When a strong base is added to a buffer, what happens? It reacts with the conjugate base component, it reacts with a weak acid component, it reacts with the water component, or it reacts with nothing in the buffer. All right. So the answer to this here, anybody want to say it? Did you know? Yes, it is in fact B. The strong base will react with the weak acid component of the buffer. Yes, yes, very good. Has everybody scanned just to make sure we have attendance? Yes, good, okay. All right, so here's an example of a buffer, a buffer question, buffer calculation. We've got a buffer and it's made by adding 0.3 moles of acetic acid and 0.3 moles of sodium acetate enough to make water uh, with enough water to make one liter right so calculate the pH after you add in 0.2 mol, 0.02 moles of sodium hydroxide so this is a very simplified way of asking this question okay most of the time what will happen in the questions that you get like from uh, the assignments and the exam and stuff like that it won't give you it in moles right what you're going to have to do is actually, can, it'll give it to you in molar, and you have to convert it to moles, right? So remember that moles is equal to the number of moles, sorry, molar is equal to the number of moles divided by one liter. And the re, one of the reasons why it's already in moles that easy is because you made it one liter, right? But it's never going to be that easy. You're going to have to remember to convert to moles, okay? So in this equate, in this particular problem, again, we start out with the so, uh, the the acid being uh, acetic acid, 0.3 moles, right? And we also start out with 0.3 moles of sodium acetate, right? And we're gonna add to it the sodium hydroxide, uh, 0.02 moles. So we, of course, come up with our ice table here. 
And since we did a strong acid, right? We did a, start, a strong base plus a weak acid. We start out with, that's going to be our equation. So here's our equation right here, our, our weak acid, our strong base, and it becomes water and the conjugate base, right? Just like it said in that little you're welcome chart I gave you a second ago, okay? And so the biggest thing, the biggest change here, though, is no longer do we see equilibrium here. We see after the reaction here now, right? And if, instead of seeing initial here, we see before the reaction. So before the reaction, the buffer had, uh, before the reaction, the buffer had 0.3, right? It had point, uh, 0.3 of the, uh, of the uh, acetic acid, 0 0.02 of the hydroxide, and at the end, I mean, sorry, and on the other side, it had the 0 0.3 of the sodium acetate, right? The sodium acetate, which was the, uh, the buffering agent, okay? And so, what's the change going to be? Well, when we add in the, when we add in the 0 0.02 mol moles of sodium hydroxide, we lose those moles of sodium hydroxide because they pull off protons from the acetic acid. So, you'll lose the exact same number of moles of sodium hydroxide that you put in, and you'll also lose the same number of moles of acetic acid because the acetic acid became what? The acetate ion, right? And that's why on this side, you get 0 0.02 moles more of the acetate ion. These 0 0.02 moles of the acetate ion, right, came from the fact that these 0 0.02 moles of hydroxide pulled off uh, 0 0.02 moles of protons from the acetic acid, okay? So it's simple arithmetic now, okay? Simple arithmetic, this minus this gives you that, right? This minus this gives you zero. This plus this gets you that, right? And so now after, reaction, after the reaction, you have 0.28 for the uh, acetic acid and you have 0 0.320 for the acetate ion. And Mary, I have wonderful news for you. We have decided to move the due date of the report to Friday at 11.59 p.m. <laughs> so, <laughs> I should have had you guys write the, do the uh, end of course evaluations today. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Okay, totally kidding. Oh, that reminds me. Um, um, don't tell me your name. I just said, Kimberly, you were not here on Monday. You have to do your end of course evaluation. We'll do it later, though, like during lab, because there are so few people, few people in here that haven't done it in lab. Okay, so of course, what do you do now? You've got, you've got your, so now that you've done this, this kind of modified ice table, you've got your number of moles of acetate, and you've got your number of moles of, uh, of uh, acetic acid. You plug it into the ice, the uh, henderson hausebach equation, right? You have, an, you, you have a Ka because you know what the Ka of acetic acid is. You can get that from a chart. And then you can plug in the acetate concentration here, or number of moles here, and then the uh, uh, acetic acid things, uh, acetic acid concentration there, or number of moles there, and this is what you get. So one thing you do need to pay attention to here for all of you that are actually using writing your prelabs, this is a typo. This should not say number of moles of HA. That should say number of moles of A minus. So that's a typo. Fix that in your notes. So when you're when you're so that when you're doing your notes, you don't get confused, you know? And then over here, there should be number of moles of HA, not A minus, okay? The, the, the book publisher screwed that one up there, okay? So just make sure, you, uh, make sure you know, right? Because it's always gonna be the base over the acid, right? It will never be the acid over the base. So make sure you have that clear, okay? Huh? Yeah, it wouldn't make sense, right, exactly. So, quite easy. Plug in the Ka for acetic acid there, take the negative log of that thing, you get 4.74, and then take the log of the 0.32 over the uh, 0.3, uh, 0.28. Again, those numbers come from this ice table, right? 0 0.28, 0 0.32, right? And you get a pH of 4.8 for the uh, the concentrate sorry the pH of that buffer that we just talked about okay so now we can talk about how mixing things together will change the pH and stuff like that right so here 
we had we start out with one liter of buffer. It's 0.3 uh, of the acetate, 0.3 of the acetic acid again. Uh, we know it's a pH of 7.4. Uh, interestingly enough, we added in sodium hydroxide to that same thing earlier, didn't we? And it only went up to to 4.8, right? Isn't that, isn't that crazy how a buffer? Oops, went the wrong way. Isn't that crazy how a buffer keeps it from changing pH, right? Crazy. And we added in like a lot of sodium hydroxide, right? That's crazy. Strong, strong base. So buffers really do work. Sorry. So we added in those five mils right there. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so in this picture, right, we have 0 0.3, 0 0.3 of each the acetic acid and the acetate within the one liter buffer. We can add in uh, five mils of four molar sodium hydroxide. That's pretty concentrated. And it brings us to 4.8 pH. It, it increases the, the, the pH by 0 0.06 units, almost nothing. And then uh, we have water now. We got a liter of water, right? And then if we add a liter of water, uh, water is semi-acidic, semi right? And so, uh, no, uh, so, what am I saying? Water is not semi-acidic. Is water, no, semi, water is neutral, my apologies. Anyway, we have our water. We add, if we just have water at pH 7, and we add in, uh, five mils of sodium hydroxide, it immediately increases the pH by like 5.3, right, uh, units. So you go from 7 pH to uh, 12.3 pH. Sorry, there's like a little glare on there. I couldn't see what the number said, right? So notice how you have a buffer here. You add the, the, this amount of sodium hydroxide, it only goes up by 0 0.06 units. But if you just have water with no buffering in there, right, the base will immediately increase the pH by 5.3 pH units, right, all the way up to 12. Now you have a very basic solution. Cool stuff, right? So what is the pH of, uh, what is the pH of five mils of sodium hydroxide, four molar sodium hydroxide is equal to one, equal to one liter of water. You see it there, right? And then uh, what if that one liter, uh, what if one liter of buffer, had, what if it's one liter of buffer? And then you see that right there, right? Cool stuff, cool stuff. Good stuff. Right, so the re I can show you now how these calculations are done. Okay, so here we have our five liters, five liters. Was it five liters? Five mils, wasn't it? Five mils of water, right? Times the four molar, right? Gives you uh, this number of moles of sodium hydroxide, right? And then, uh, uh, and then you have to get the total the total volume. So it's the one liter plus the five mils gets the total volume of the solution. Divide that by the number of moles, uh, uh, and then you get the new molarity, which is 0 0.00199 molar sodium hydroxide, right? And quite easily, all you do is do the POH, and then you do the minus of the POH. Uh, you get the POH, and you subtract it from the pH. I mean, sorry, from 14 to get the pH, right? And that's how you get that number. So it's really easy to do those kind of kinds of calculations. Really easy. So remember, you had this number of moles, two moles of sodium hydroxide added right there, right? So you add in two, the point, the two moles of sodium hydroxide. I got a little confused because it said two times <laughs> 10 to the negative three, but that's really just, yeah, 0 .002. Uh, and so if you have that there, what happens is you lose 0 .002 from the acetic acid and you gain 0 .002 from the acetate, right? Because the hydroxide pulled off the protons from the, acid, the acetic acid to make the acetate. So you know, just basically doing the ice table in your head, right? If you started out with 0.3 moles of acetic acid and you have 0 0.002 moles of hydroxide, it will pull off 2.002 moles of hydrox of the proton from the acetic acid, giving you two extra moles of the 0 0.002 extra moles of the acetate. So same as before, we can pull this into the henderson hasselbalch equation. This is the, K, uh, uh, the Ka of acetic acid, 1 point times 10 to the negative 5. Take the negative log of that, and then you do the positive log uh, plus the log of the ratio of the, the acid, uh, sorry, the base divided by the acid, right? And so uh, 0 0.302 divided by 0 0.298, and you get 4.75 as the pH, which is the original buffer. So, sorry, sorry, which is the new content, new pH when the original buffer was at 7.4. So you only moved up like 0 0.01 here, right? So kind of neat, kind of neat, right? Very, very small uh, change because you have a buffer, okay? So we already did a titration in lab. 
last week, but we'll do another one today where you actually will get to use you get to use a pH meter, right? If you read your if you did your pre-lab exercise and your your instructions, you saw that we have a pH meter this time, right? Uh, so basically, we already know what's going on here. We have like an unknown concentration of acid down there. We have a known concentration of base. We titrate it till it gets to the end point, that point where it's slightly pink, not too pink, not fuchsia, right? Uh, and then you can do some molar uh, stoichiometry math to figure out what the concentration is of the of the unknown acid based on the concentration of the uh, uh, known uh, the uh, known base, right? But except in the last lab, you won't have to do this in today's lab. In the last lab, you had to actually start out by titrating the uh, KHP first because it was a solid, right? To get what your uh, to get what your hydroxide concentration first, and then you use this hydroxide concentration that you just figured out from the KHP to titrate the acid, uh, the, the unknown acid, right? And then uh, that's when you actually get to the titration of the unknown acid part, okay? So a pH meter or indicators are used to determine when the solution has reached the equivalence point, the amount that the acid equals that of the base, right? And that's that point you saw when it was turning slightly pink. When it goes too pink, then you've gone over, you've gone past the equivalence point. So what happens when you titrate a strong acid with a strong base, which is basically what you did in the last experiment, right? It starts out like really low over here, right? So we have pH on the on the uh, y-axis, and we have mils of sodium hydroxide on the uh, mils of sodium hydroxide on the x-axis, right? And as you can see, right? So a lot of you guys, when you were doing the titration, it, you weren't seeing anything turn pink, right? You're like, what's going on here? Nothing's turning pink. Well, it's because it actually starts out super slow, right? At the very beginning, when you're when you're when you have an acid, it starts out super slow, right? And it doesn't start turning pink until it gets to up around here, right? So that's the big key point, right? From the start of the titration near the to the to near the equivalence point, the pH goes up really slow, right? And why is that? That is because you're starting out with hydrochloric acid, it's floating around in the water, and then you add in the uh, sodium hydroxide, right? And the sodium hydroxide starts to interact. Right uh, with the uh, uh, with the acid, making the sodium chloride. Right, but it doesn't actually do that. It doesn't actually make it in an appreciable amount to get close to the uh, close to the uh, equivalence point, which is right here. And so you notice once you get to the equivalence point, right, you have this really straight line, right, a very straight line that goes all the way up to pH 12. So notice that the reason why when you go past the equivalence point, basically get into a fuchsia color, right. You've, you've kind of messed up a little bit because it doesn't take much, right, to go from the equivalence point all the way to, you know, to pH 12. You're no longer, because you're wanting to get to pH 7, right? That's the equivalence point. It doesn't take that much to get it all the way to pH 12, right? So that's 10 mils right there, right? It takes, it takes like less than one mil for you to get to, get from pH 7, right, to pH, um, pH 11, right? And so that's why, when we tell you to do the titrations and you're dropping the, the phenothaline, I mean the, the uh, hydroxide into the acid and the phenothaline is turning pink, right? We want a very, very, very light pink color, right? And even if it goes away after a while, you're probably better off leaving it at that light pink color and letting it go away than adding one more mil. As many of you saw, when you added one more mil, it shot straight up to pink, right? To fuchsia, okay? And so over here, it levels off after you get to the equivalence point to about pH uh, 12, right? But the important thing to note here is that, uh, is that at the equivalence point, there's a very rapid rise, right? A very rapid rise. Before, very slow. After, it levels off. So the equivalence point is where we want to get pH 7, okay? Good stuff, right? So here, uh, this is clearly important because I have a slide just about it. At the equivalence point, the pH is 7. Uh, as more base is added, the pH levels off again, so it, sl it slows back down again, right? So this is interesting, right? Let's do it the other way, right? Say we started out with a strong base, okay? And now we're titrating into it a strong acid. The same thing happens, right? The same thing happens where you are, uh, where you are starting out a very high pH, right? And you add in the, the, the acid, and it really slowly goes down, super slow. Until you get to almost pH 7, or uh, sorry, uh, to the equivalence point, right? And right at the equivalence point, right, it only takes less than a mil of water to get you from this point to this point, and you're fully acidic again, right? 
So it's literally the exact same thing. Try trading a strong asset with a strong base, right? Is the exact same thing as try trading a strong base with a strong asset, just backwards, right? Uh, so yeah, so just remember that, you know, at this point here, right, we have a pH that's less than seven. Over here, we have a pH that's more than seven. And here we have a pH that's seven, okay? For both of the of these guys, okay? For both of these guys, depending on what the graph looks like, which is what you'll be doing today in lab, actually. You're gonna be doing this, this, this titration where you, uh, you are going to plot these points using the pH meter and uh, make these, may actually do this. And so that's why you actually need a, a partner for this lab because one of you will be doing the, the titration part with the burette. We're going one mil at a time. And then when you get to close to the equivalence point, right, you're gonna go and do uh, 0.4 mils at, or a quarter of a mil at a time. And the whole time that you're letting one mil down and closing, one mil down and closing, your partner is going to be writing down the pH that's on the pH meter, right? So that's why you need two people to do this experiment. Does that make sense? Uh, there is an odd number of people in here, so there might be a group of three. Is there an odd number of people? Is there anybody missing four, six? Yes, there's 11 people in here. Okay. Oopsies. So here's your next question. At the beginning of a titration, what happens to the pH? At the beginning of a titration, what happens to the pH? Okay. So... What is the answer to this one? Does it rise slowly, lower slowly, rises fast? Hey, exactly, it rises very slowly. The pH rises very slowly, right? Good job, good job. So let's keep on going, all right? So let's say we're titrating, uh, uh, let's talk about titrating weak acid with a strong base, which is what you'll be doing in the lab today too, right? You can use the Ka to find, what, find out what the initial pH is, right? Uh, and so here, it's, it's very similar to what's happening with the strong acid, strong base, but notice that the equivalence point part is much smaller. It's much shorter, okay? Uh, so find the pH using the, uh, find the pH in the buffer region using the stoichiometry followed by the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. And at the equivalence point, the big thing here, okay? The big thing here is that at the equivalence point, the pH is actually greater than seven because the contrary base of the weak acid is used to determine the pH, right? So when you, the thing I want you to take away from this particular, this particular slide here is that when you titrate a weak acid with a strong base, unlike in strong base, strong acid, where the pH is seven at the equivalence point, here with a weak acid and strong base, the pH is gonna be greater than seven, right? It's gonna be greater than seven, okay? So you can see how the equivalent points here is actually at like, what is that, 8.5 8 or something, right above nine, right? Right above nine, so. So, as more base is added, the pH levels off, and this is exactly what happens to strong acids, right? So the only difference, oopsies, the only difference between this and the strong acid is that notice right here, this shape right here is different. The increase is a little bit not as steep. I mean, sorry, steeper, right? The increase is steeper, right? And the uh, the uh, increase is steeper to the equivalence point, so such that the pH is now going to be above seven when you get to the equivalence point, but then after that, it actually levels off like it is in strong base. There's no difference with a strong base, right? So, calculating pH when some weak acid is neutralized, right? You can start out with the solution containing the weak acid. You can add some strong base, right? So that's the example that we just showed a second ago, right? In this neutralization reaction, of course, the acid decreases and the acetate or the conjugate base increases, and so this is the equation you'll have. You'll have the HA plus the OH minus makes the conjugate base and the water. Now you can go through and calculate all the new values using the ice table, uh, the modified ice table, not the one that has the equilibrium, but the one that says before and after, right? And then you'll get the pH from that, right? So calculate the moles of weak acid, calculate the moles of the base, uh, and then the moles of the anion formed and subtract it from the mole of the acid to see how much acid is left and then use the henderson Hasselbalch to find the pH. So those are the steps. So this is just reiterating the fact that it's never gonna be that easy. We're never gonna give you just the number of moles. It's gonna be a concentration. You'll have to figure out the number of moles yourself, which is easy, okay? And so, right, um, so in what ways does a weak acid titration differ from strong acid titration, right? And you can, you, can be, you can be guaranteed that I'll ask you this question on the exam or on a quiz, right? 
Which of which of the following is different between a titration of a weak acid and titration of a strong acid? Well, the first thing is that titration of weak acid. Uh, sorry, uh, the first thing is that the solution of weak acid has a higher initial pH than a stronger acid, right, than a strong acid, right? And then the pH strong the pH near the uh, the pH near the equivalence point is smaller than the smaller for a weak acid. So this is at least partially due to the buffer region. And then the pH at the equivalence point is greater than 7 for the weak acid. Um, so here's your next question, which the following is not true about the difference between a weak acid and a strong acid titration. A solution of weak acid has a higher initial pH than a strong acid. The pH change near the equivalence point is smaller for a weak acid, at least departure due to the buffer region, right? And then the pH of the equivalence point is greater than 7 for a weak acid, or all of these are true. So what do you guys think? <laughs> yes, it is D. It is all true. All those things are true. But I might change something. For example, I might change it to a lower initial pH in a strong acid, right? Or I might change it to a bigger point, uh, equivalence point is bigger, right? And stuff like that. But all these are true right here, okay? All these are true. All right, so the use of indicators. So the indicator that you used back in the, uh, when the indicator that you used back in the, the lab last week, right, was phenylphthalein, which turned pink upon uh, bas basicity, right? Or alkalinity. Right, but what exactly are indicators? Their in indicators are actually weak acids that have a different color from their conjugate base form. Right, so the conjugate base form, for example, uh, uh, for phenethylene, right, its conjugate base is pink, and that's why it turns pink, or most of it turns pink, or most of it turns basic. Right, so that's pretty cool that you can actually lose a proton. You can be, you can begin clear, right, but then you lose a proton, and what happens? You turn pink. It's kind of neat, right? Uh, so the indicator, each indicator has its own pH range for which over it changes color, right? And an indicator can be used to find the equivalence point in the titration as long as the color in the volume, the small volume region uh, uh, rapidly changes, where it rapidly changes, right? So because you want to make it, uh, you want to make it so that the, the, the indicator has a very similar kind of titration curve as what you're titrating, okay? Oh my God, what is all this white stuff? Is this like chalk? What is this chalk? Nasty. Anyway, good thing we're wearing masks. Otherwise, I'd be sneezing. So here's some indicators, right? Here's phenylphthalein right here. And its color change point, right, uh, is right here. Okay? So that's pretty good because you want, that's, that's where you want to see the equivalence point right there, right? We also have another one here, right, called methyl red. And it's, it's, it uses, you can use this also for strong acid, strong base. And it's a, this color change happens here at a little more acidic, right? A little more acidic. Uh, so here, uh, this is this is very reminiscent of a a, uh, a weak acid strong base, right? And I don't even know. Uh, yeah. So there's also that's also phenethylene right there, right? And the great thing about phenethylene is that its color change region is exactly where we need it to be for the weak acid weak base, right? Uh, equivalence, right? And over here we have methyl uh, methyl red, right? And again, the equivalence point here is up there, but the color change region is down here. So this is a poor choice, a very poor choice for acetic acid or a weak acid, right? Because you want the color change to happen over here, the, with the the color change to happen where the equivalence point is, because that's where where you need it to be to actually see it happening, right? To see where the the end point is, right? So when doing a, a weak acid like acetic acid or something like that. Titration with a strong base, phenothalene is good, but methyl red is bad, right? Methyl red is bad. So uh, this is just zoomed in right here, right? <laughs> zoomed in. Uh, here we see the. Uh, 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 no, it's not a zoom in. This is a, this is a different one. Okay. So here we have uh, here we have the equivalence point for whatever this acid is. I don't know what this acid is. I'm not sure what this acid is, but. Uh, with, for this particular acid, this titration curve has the equivalence point here in a more acidic region. And so phenylphthalein is bad for this, right? Bad indicator. 
But now we can use mouth of red because mouth of red has a good good color change right there exactly in the middle of where the equivalence point is. So for this, whatever this acid and base titration is, methyl red is a good indicator for that. And there's many, 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 many different indicators you can use. Uh, one that we did back in high school was uh, cabbage water, right? Red cabbage water. So that's a good time. And you can actually make a rainbow of colors with cabbage water, I think. I think that was cabbage water that we did that with, depending on the pH. So... The thing I want you to know about this, I won't, I'm not going to ask you on the exam to actually calculate, calculate any KAs, uh, KAs or, 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 or concentrations using uh, with polyprotic acids, right? But basically, a polyprotic acid is an acid that has more than one proton it can lose. But the thing that I want you to know about polyprotic acids that's very important is that when it loses its first, first proton, it has one KA. When it loses a second proton, right? It has another Ka, right? So it has multiple Ka's, okay? So the number of Ka's, Ka's it, have, it has is based on the number of protons it can lose. So if you recall back to the, the problem that I gave you in discussion section two weeks ago where we had phosphorus acid, right? That thing had three protons, but only two of them were actually acidic. So how many Ka's does it have? How many Ka, PKs or Ka's does it have for phosphorus acid? since it only had two protons that are acidic, even though it has three protons in the formula. Two of them, exactly, right? So that's the thing I want you to know about polyprotic acids. I just need you to know that the number of protons that are acidic is equal to the number of Ka's it has, right? And then the, num the, the, uh, and then the, the highest Ka or the lowest pKa will be the one for the first proton, and then so on, right? All right, so which of the following is not true about indicators? Indicators have strong, are strong acids that have a different color. Each indicator has its own pH. An indicator can be used to find the equivalence point, or all of these is true. So what do we think the answer to this one is? Yes, that is exactly right. It is A, because it's not, uh, uh, indicators are definitely not strong acids, they're weak acids. Good job. So that takes us to the last part of this lecture, which is solution or solubility equilibria, okay? I know, right? We had chemical equilibria, then we had acid-base equilibria, which we spent the last few days on that. And the very last thing we need to talk about now is solution equilibria, okay? So the thing about solution equilibria, right, is that it has a different letter, different consonant. So remember that in, uh, uh, remember in chemical equilibria, the, the equilibrium constant was Kc for things that had concentrations. And then the equilibrium constant was Kp for things that had pressures, right? And then the equilibrium constant for acids is Ka, right? And then the equilibrium constant for bases was Kb, right? Well, now we have the solution constant or the solution uh, solubility product constant for solution equilibria, and it's Ksp, okay, Ksp. So the thing that we need to know here is that I, the, this is based mostly on ionic compounds, right, like sodium chloride, things that are ionic salts and stuff, right? And those are extremely strong electrolytes, and so they will completely disassociate in water when they dissolve, right? They will completely disassociate. So when an equilibrium equation is written, the solid is the reactant, and the ions are going to be the uh, the ions in solution are going to be the products. Kind of like when we were doing acid-base equilibrium, we had the acid as the reactant, right, and then the conjugate base and the conjugate acid as the products, right. But here it's going to be the solid as the uh, the, the the reactant, and then the solution uh, ions will be the products, right. And we can make that equal to Ksp. And this one's much easier because there's only two things. Take, for example, we have barium sulfate solid right here, right? And in this equation, barium 2 or barium 2 plus, right, uh, 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 disassociates to sulfate 2 minus, right? And so to do the KSP equation, it's quite simple. It's KSP equals barium sulfate concentration times the, sorry, the barium, sul the barium uh, uh, concentration times the sulfate concentration, right? Cool stuff. 
right? So again, though, just remember that coefficients in the balanced chemical equation represents what in the equilibrium equation expression? It represents those exponents, right? And so, for example, now we have something like barium phosphate, right? And for barium phosphate, you need three bariums for every two phosphates. So when they separate out, right, the coefficients actually, the, the subscripts become the coefficients. So you have three, bar three moles of barium and you have two moles of phosphate, right? So of course, this, this three right here and this two right here for those two ions become the, uh, the, uh, the, the exponents in the equilibrium expression. So now KSP equals K, uh, K sorry, KSP equals BA to the third, right? And then PO4 to the second, right? So it's the same thing as it was with chemical equilibria and acid-base equilibria. The, 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 the coefficients become what? The exponents, right? So just to be clear though, KSP is not the same thing as solubility. Solubility is the quantity of a substance that dissolves from a saturated, to form a saturated solution. So the uh, common units for solubility, of course, is grams per, meter, per, per liter or moles per liter. So like, for example, you can, you can look up uh, sodium chloride in Wikipedia, right? And it will say solubility in water. And I think that salts, sodium chloride solubility in water is like 36 grams per, 36 grams per liter, or maybe, yeah, I think that's right. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But that's what you, you usually see that as. You'll see that as some kind of like salt per grams per liter, right? Of, some kind of salt grams per liter for solubility. So solubility, solubility versus the solubility product constant or the KSP. We got the grams, uh, the mass of solubility of a compound, which is grams per liter, right? So like I was saying, I think that salt, sodium chlorides, uh, solubility is 36 grams per liter. It could be something else, but I think that's what it is. Okay. And then uh, you can take that uh, with the formula weight and you can get moles per liter there. And then from that, using its empirical formula, right, for sodium chloride, it's just NaCl, right? You get the molar concentration of each of the ions. And then from that, you can do the KSP equation because you just put the KSP equation equal to the concentration of the moles of uh, the, mo the concentrations of uh, sodium times the concentration of chloride, right? So, which of the following is not true about solution equilibria? Because ionic compounds are weak electrolytes, they disassociate to a small extent when they dissolve. When equilibrium equation is written, the solid re is of the reactant and the ions of the, solu of the solution are in the products. The equilibrium constant expression is called the solubility product constant, or all of these are true. <laughs> All right, so anybody got any guesses? What's the answer to this one? It is A. In fact, it is A. Ionic compounds are definitely not weak electrolytes. What are they? Strong electrolytes. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, so here's an example of a question that I might ask you. Right. If I, I'm going to ask you, for example, what is the KSP for calcium fluoride when it's uh, oh, sorry, let me say that again. What is the solubility of calcium fluoride if the KSP is equal to 3.9 times 10 to negative 11? Right. So what is the what is the solubility of calcium fluoride when its KSP is 3.9 times 10 to negative 11? First thing you got to do is write out the equation. As always, we have calcium fluoride, which is a solid. It becomes calcium. Uh, and then uh, fluoride, two fluorides, right, in aqueous solution. So KSP then equals calcium fluoride, uh, calcium times fluoride squared equals 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11, right? So you have this little equation here. It sure does look like those Ka equations we have to do, right? And so, again, I have to use the ice table, right? Now, at the very beginning of the ice table, we have here, uh, calcium fluoride, right? And remember, when it's a solid, you don't have to put anything there, right? Uh, and then uh, initial concentration of calcium is zero. And then uh, remember, you have two moles of fluoride, so that's also zero. What that means then is that when you have a change, all this stuff is still zero for the solid, right? 
But when you have to change, you only have one mole of calcium, but you have two moles of fluoride, right? So it's going to be plus X here, plus 2X here. Thus, the equilibrium concentration of both of those ions is going to be X and then 2X. So not as complicated as the, uh, as the acid base or the chemical equilibrium, right? So then you just put it all together, right? where you have 3.9 times 10 to negative 11, and that equals x times x squared, sorry, times x times 2x squared, right? Because remember that the, the, the two from the coefficient becomes an exponent, right? And so you just combine like terms and you get 4x squared, right? So what do you do now? What do you do when you have a cube, a 4x cubed rather? What do you do when you have a cubed? How do you solve for x when you have a cubed? Yes, exactly right. Divide both sides by 4. Then you get, to, then you get x cubed, right? And you do the cube root of, of x, right? And if you don't know how to do the cube root of x, you should have a button on your calculator that, has, that looks like a square root like this, but then above it, it has an x in it. And that's how you should do a cube root, right? And so they'll ask you what the x should be, and then you can do the cube root, okay? At least the calculators I want you to use in the exam have those, right? So quite simply then, right, these are a lot easier than doing uh, chemical equilibrium questions, right? Because now you have x, and now you want the answer in grams per mil, I mean grams per liter, because that's what most solubility is listed as. So all you have to do is multiply by its molar mass, right? Uh, the molar mass of calcium fluoride, times that, and you'll get 0 0.016 grams per liter. Neat stuff, right? Neat stuff. Neat stuff. So there's some of, there's, of course, there's uh, factors affecting solubility. Um, and so here, right, here's pure water, right? And then the molar solubility of calcium fluoride, right? And the concentration is sodium fluoride, right? And notice that the solubility, of calcium, the solubility of calcium fluoride decreases sharply as a common ion is added, right? So the common ion here is fluoride. That's the common ion with the calcium fluoride or the fluoride and calcium fluoride. And when you're adding stuff, when you're adding calcium fluoride to a solution that already has fluoride in it, that common ion makes the, the, the solubility decrease sharply, as they say in this slide, okay? So... Let's try this now. Uh, what is the molar solubility of uh, of a uh, of a uh, what is the molar solubility of uh, calcium fluoride in one point zero one moles of calcium nitrate? So now the the common ion is calcium, right? So you know it's going to be different because it's calcium. So same as before, make out your equation. Calcium fluoride becomes calcium plus two fluorides. KSP equals the calcium concentration times the fluoride concentration squared equals three point nine times 10 to the negative 11, which is the KSP for calcium fluoride. By the way, KSPs are actually found in a, in a chart in your book, right? But, you know, we'll give them to you on a test or something. You don't have to look it up in the book, right? So what do you do now? Again, what you have to do is you have to make the ice table, but instead of having all the same stuff as you had before, you start out instead now with the initial being 0 0.01 for that extra calcium instead of zero like you had before, so now it's 0 0.10 plus X and then 2X for the fluoride, right? And then you put it all together again. Now it's 3.9 times 10 to negative 11. That equals, <clears throat> excuse me, 0 0.01 plus X, right? Times 2X squared. And again, this is another you welcome moment. You can assume that this plus X is tiny and drop the plus X, right? So now it's just gonna be 0 0.01 uh, 0 0.01 uh, times 2x squared, and that's easy. Just multiply those together, divide both sides, and then square root, and you get the uh, uh, x equals 0 0.1 times 10 to the negative 5 molar, right? And then to get the to get the grams per mil or grams per liter, which is what we use to say what the solubility is, uh, multiply by its molecular weight, right, of calcium fluoride. So yeah, that was a you're welcome moment right there, by the way. You guys didn't you guys didn't clap or anything. But <laughs> I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. Anyway, anyway, so yeah, just remember, 
so also with the solubility product constants, when you have a plus X or a minus X, what can you do? You can drop it, okay? The only time you cannot drop an X is when you're doing the KPs and KCs, right? Which is the chemical equilibrium stuff. But for acid-base equilibrium, you can drop the plus X, drop the minus X. For solution equilibrium, you can drop the X plus X or minus X, okay? Anyway, so pH also affects solubility too. If a substance has a basic anion, it will become more soluble in an acidic solution. That's just something you gotta remember. And remember that buffers control pH, so when the buffer is used, there's no change in the concentration of the hydroxide ion, right? And uh, another thing you just, you know, kind of need to remember. All right, so this is just a picture showing you the effects of solubility when it's, uh, when it's pH, right? So here, the salt ions in the concentrated base of the weak acid, right? So solubility increases as the pH increases, okay? And then on this one here, right, um, Salt ions, whose anions is the concentrated base of a strong acid, the solubility is unaffected, right, when the pH increases, uh, or with any change of pH, really, right? And so uh, if you have a, uh, a common, again, if you have the, 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 the salt ions, concentrated base is the same, then solubility increases, but when it's different, then it doesn't even matter. Nothing changes, okay? So that's just one of those things you got to remember. Okay, so complex ion formations, right? Uh, this is not that big a thing, but we'll go over it just real quickly. Uh, metal ions can act as Lewis acids to form complex ions, uh, and then Lewis bases, in, and then act as Lewis bases in the solvent. So basically what happens here is you have a metal and, and, uh, and, uh, and a whole bunch of things, ions can surround it, right? So, oh, here we go. This, is, this, is, this part is important though. Okay, so how complex ion formations affect solubility, right? So, Silver chloride is actually insoluble because it has a KSP, uh, uh, a KSP of 1.6 times 10 to negative 10, right? In the presence of ammonia, the solubility critically increases and then uh, because silver will form a complex with the ammonia ions, right? So here we have, we have sodium, uh, not sodium chloride, but silver chloride, right? It's a solid right there, right? There's that solid sodium chloride and only, I mean, silver, silver chloride. And only a couple, there's only one or one, one ion of chloride and one, one ion of silver in there. So most of it is insoluble, right? But then you add in some ammonia and the ammonia likes to uh, surround the, uh, surround the uh, silver. That's the little white balls right there. The little white balls surrounding the, uh, the silver. And that makes it way more soluble, right? And so eventually you add enough of it in there, right? You get sodium ammonia, sodium Ammonate. I have no idea what that would be called, but it's not sodium silver. Silver uh, ammonate or something like that. Is, that, is it said in there? Does it say what, is it, what the name of it is? It doesn't say what the name of it, but it's basically silver with the ammonia with ammonia <laughs> as a complex, right? And so it becomes a lot more soluble, right? This is the last thing I want you to know for this test right here. Okay, and we'll stop it there. So we need to be able to decide whether or not a precipitate a precipitate will form. Okay, when you add, uh, when you uh, when you uh, when you have uh, uh, solutes in solution. Okay, and so again we have this thing called Q, right, known as a reaction quotient, and then we can compare that with KSP. So Q, uh, just like it is in acid base equilibria, right, has the same formula, right, as uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, equilibrium, the KEQ, right. But remember that the KEQ expression is the concentrations of every component at equilibrium, whereas Q can be the, any equilibrium, right? Not any equilibrium, but it can be at any time, any point in time. It doesn't have to be an equilibrium, okay? So that's how it is with acid-base equilibria. That's how it is with, 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 with chemical equilibria, right? It's always going to be the products divided by the reactants, and that equals Q, right? Uh, but Q, just remember, is at any point in time, not, at, not necessarily at equilibrium, okay? So if Q equals KEQ, right, that means the reaction is at equilibrium, okay? So the same thing can happen here with KSP, okay? With KSP, if Q equals KSP, the system is at equilibrium and the solution is saturated, okay? So whereas in acid-base equilibria, if Q equals KA or Q equals KB, you had a, uh, you had your, your or even in the, uh, 
even in the uh, uh, the the chemical equilibrium with KC and KP, if any of those equaled Q, your re reaction was at equilibrium, right? But specifically here, in solution, uh, in solution equilibria, if K equal KSP equals K Q, then your solution is saturated, right? If Q is less than KSP, then more solids can dissolve and no precipitate forms. So this would be an unsaturated solution, right? It's not saturated, it's unsaturated. And then if Q is greater than KSP, then you've reached the saturation point and you're trying to go beyond that and now precipitates will form, okay? But if you heat it up, you can make it a super saturated solution like those Wonder Packs things that Marla made me buy at the home garden show, right? So those are the things you, I need you to remember from this slide, this slide right here. Q equals KSP means you have a saturated solution. The system is at equilibrium, right? And that system as that equilibrium is true of, of Q equals KSP, Q equals KP, Q equals C, Q equals KA, and Q equals KB, right? But for this specific uh, one here, the solution equilibrium, it also means that the solution is saturated. If Q is less than KSP, you're at an unsaturated solution, so you can actually dissolve more stuff and no precipitate forms, right? And then if Q is greater than KSP, then you've reached the saturation point and precipitate will form. You cannot dissolve anything else, okay? You cannot dissolve anything else. So the last thing I want to do is this, this particular slide right here, which of the following represents the solution that is unsaturated. And this is the last slide for today. All right, so what do we think the answer is? Yes, it is in fact B. When Q is less than KSP, you have an unsaturated solution. When you have Q is greater than KSP, you have a saturated solution. That is, you cannot add any more stuff to it. It will perform precipitate. And then when Q equals KSP, you're saturated and you're at the equilibrium. And that is it, right?